Have you been looking for something to scratch the itch after playing Crash Bandicoot? You know, you've beaten the Insane Trilogy and played through 4. So what's next? Well, the guys at Gamecom gave me a key for Babool the Walking Box, which tries to fill that niche and scratch the itch. Hi, my name is Avalon, and welcome to my reviews. I resent the current review scoring system, and basically any game under 8 out of 10 is bad, and everything else seems to get 8 or 9 anyway. So I came up with my own system, which I've put in the description, and I'll rate 10 categories out of 5. If I give it a 3, then it's as expected. 4 and 2 are good and poor, and 5 or 1 is perfection or complete failure. So for me, a game scoring 25 out of 50, it's an alright game. So let's get into this. So, Babool the Walking Box is a game that feels very similar to Crash Bandicoot, with enemies that follow set path as adventure platforming and those fixed angles that we're all used to. The thing that sets it apart is not anything really super exciting. It's the same game, a bit more simple. Babool has fewer player interactions, fewer interactable objects and fewer hazards. It's taken the core style of gameplay and then really dumbed it down. This should have allowed the Gamecom team to really focus on creating some unique platforming experiences, some unique enemies, that sort of thing. Um, but outside of changing the skins on the enemies and increasing the number of enemies, they really haven't done much. Uh, you might feel like it's a bit unfair, but there really are only two types of core enemy. There's roaming or chasing, they get reskinned depending on the zone, but that's all that changes. Then there's a launching enemy, sometimes it throws potions, sometimes it shoots cannonballs, but the way you interact with it doesn't change at all. Finally, they've got the environmental enemies. Not really enemies, but you get my point. Um, and quite simply, you just don't touch them. It doesn't matter if it's a spike track or something that spins, it's all the same, you avoid them in the same way. There is absolutely nothing too unique or developmental about any of this. But avoiding the enemies isn't always easy. Not because of good game design or interesting layering, but often just because of the controls and the bad game design. So let's talk about those controls. Firstly, you'll notice in my footage that it has a mouse and keyboard in the bottom left for the whole game. Weirdly, I was using a controller, so I'm not sure why it didn't change. It definitely can, I've seen other footage where, you know, they have a controls for the controller in the corner instead, but you only need to know those two buttons anyway. Jump and attack. Unless you're in the air, in which case everything is attack. If the ball is just one pixel off the ground and you hit jump again, you'll be ground pounding, and the shockwave could potentially hit a TNT box and kill you. I don't understand this at all, there's two buttons for this, there's a jump button and an attack button, so I don't understand why they have to be merged when you're in the air. It could have just remained separate. And I hope you really like these two options because that is all you're getting for the rest of the game, there's no new skills or anything. But apart from that, and the occasional input getting eaten, there was nothing too abhorrent about the controls, just nothing particularly special either. When it comes to game design and actual gameplay, there's no distinguishing features between the enemies, which also leads to them killing you quite frequently. Are they following the route? Are they about to charge at you? It, it's really unclear. I know that the charges stand still when you're not in their radius, but sometimes you can't see them until you're charging, and it's not always possible to attack with the shockwave, because it might just explode a TNT box like I said. So there's that, but more frustratingly, Sometimes the charging enemies are hidden around the environment and it's quite clear that it's purposeful. There's a point in the desert where there's a bunny literally hidden behind a pillar that you can't see until it's already on top of you. On top of that, there's also the fact that enemies seem to have a random amount of health. Some enemies take two hits, some enemies take one hit, and it's not because of like this pink smoke that's around some of them because there's been situations where I've hit them and they've died in one, and then other situations where they don't. I really do not understand that. But whilst we're thinking about enemies that take more than one hit, let's talk about the bosses. To be fair, I quite like the boss design. The second boss, uh, Boo Boo the Rabbit, is a deranged rabbit with some really weird movements, but sadly, all of the boss fights are basically just run in a circle until the boss can be hit. Each hit invokes a new stage, but often that results in the same tactic. The final boss is a big, eh, who cares. Earlier, you know I compared this game to Crash Bandicoot, and you can think about how memorable those bosses are. You know, they interact with you constantly, but this boss, you see him once at the start of the game, and then once again at the end when you defeat him. The stage bosses in between that, they get a single line of dialogue. I mean, Boo Boo the Bunny, again, just being the best, just has manacle laughing. Um, but that's it, you don't know anything about them, you don't hear from them again, it's just pretty boring. There are also these weird puzzle gate things. I don't know how to better describe them, and weird is definitely the best word for it. And I don't dislike them, I guess. They're a cool pace break to the, to the platforming, 
um, but sometimes you can't really see the gate and the tiles at the same time, so it ends up being trial and error. And then suddenly they just disappear from the game. Just gone. Very, very weird. If you exclude the puzzles and the bosses, this game is only difficult because of the tomfoolery I've spoken about before. The enemies spawn out of sight, there's unclear hitboxes, there's random environmental objects that are solid when the other ones aren't, there's sudden lag frames, and then there's lighting that feels like it purposely changes at points to hide enemies. I mean, look at this clip. The lighting goes pink just as an enemy with pink smoke comes into vision. The game is not difficult, it's just frustrating. You will definitely die, and it probably won't be your fault. Anyway, the visuals of the game are okay. You know, they're nothing special, they're nothing poor. The boxes look pretty nice, the enemies are consistent in how they look. Some things do look like generic assets from the Unity store, but I'm not sure how much I can credit and not credit to Gamecom. They are a small team, so do bear that in mind. Uh, the environments are pretty decent though, it's just that the lighting gets really, really weird at times. Like I said, it's just okay. The audio, however. Now the audio is where the game really shines. The sound effects are acceptable, let's just ignore them. They, they do, they're fine, but the music is fantastic. The tunes in each level are really great, and it's a shame that there's a bit of repetition, but again, Gamecom are a small team. The songs that do rotate through are really, really good. And that'll be the background noise for most of this review, to be fair, so you've probably heard them. It's just simple tunes, don't get me wrong, but they really fit the environment and the game well, and they just keep it moving forwards. I'm not really sure how to segue into or out of talking about the story in the game, but previously, as I mentioned, the bosses have a little build-up in how they are. <laughs> I thought I'd try and make it sound natural. But no, the bosses, they have very little build-up, and the final boss, he, like I said, he's only at the beginning and the end of the game. So the story itself just isn't all that great or engaging. The call to action is pretty poor. But, you know, there are random characters dotted around the levels. They're quite quirky, quite unique. They're completely pointless, um, but they do create some world building and they have some interesting dialogue if you if you can be bothered to read it. They don't add much to the game, but they do just, you know, add a bit of flavour to the environment, a bit of world building. I also appreciate that they kind of wear clothes that match the themes of the areas they're in, so they fit in fine. Obviously I've mentioned the clear influence that Crash Bandicoot had on the development of this game, but the boss interactions, the characters and the gameplay are all inferior to this. And this, this title brings absolutely nothing new to the genre. It's fun for a quick pickup, but that's pretty much all it's got going for it, unfortunately. There are some challenges, they're okay, but they're really nothing groundbreaking, there's nothing genre defining. I wouldn't even say it fits into the genre too well. The TNT and Nitro boxes, which are a very basic element, they look so similar, and the chase sequences in this just really aren't impressive at all. It does, however, successfully have the camera behind the player, a 2D scrolling section, and a camera in front of the player whilst you're chased, so I guess it ticks those... boxes. Hmm. Anyway, this game really lacks innovation and development of the genre, and it really harms any hopes of originality within the genre as well. Even games about boxes aren't a new concept, you've got What the Box and other such things. It just looks like it's a bunch of other developers' ideas that have been pulled into one game. I would have liked to have seen more player control, maybe more box-specific movements as a unique twist, or maybe some box-related bosses, like, you know, in Paper Mario you had the whole punch, maybe you have a box cutter or something. I don't know, something box-related. But nothing like that appears, it's really, really unoriginal. But just because it's unoriginal doesn't mean it's expensive. So, when I'm scripting this, the Steam sale is on, so I have no money anyway. Um, but it will release at 3 quid, normally sitting at around 5, so quite cheap. If you want to push through and complete it, there is about 2 hours of content here. It's pretty worth a fiver if you ask me. But if you have the money to buy the Insane Trilogy, or you already own the Insane Trilogy, then this game is just not going to meet any expectations that you have. For me, overall, I was quite disappointed by this game. It has all of the building blocks to do something special, and it just doesn't. The frustration of hidden enemies, random lag causing unfair death just really turned me off so quickly that even the high points were kind of soured. Take for example Bobo the bunny, I loved, I wish there was more character uh, characterization for him, and they've really animated his erratic movements so well, it's just a shame we don't see more. I know for a fact that this game is going to end up sitting in my Steam library, never to be touched again. I have no desire to complete all the challenges, to get that final achievement, or just return to this game. So that's what I thought about Bubble the Walking Box. 
Have you guys played it? What did you think about it? Do we even need something to feel that sort of crash niche that was quite specific? Let me know in the comments for now. Anyways, I've been Avalon, this has been Baboo the Walking Box, and I'll see you guys next time.